Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely issues that matter most to business leaders. We'll sit down every week and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to be talking about a business leadership function that has arguably changed more in the 21st century than it did in the previous two centuries combined, marketing and marketing leadership. Joining me today is Ivan Pollard, the leader of the Conference Board's Marketing and Communication Center. Before joining us, Ivan was the chief marketing officer at General Mills. And before that, he had very large roles at consumer products companies like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Adidas, Sony, Lucasfilm, and many more. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you very much for having uh, me. So, Steve. Ivan, why can't you hold a job? Um, well, as a marketer, marketers don't hold jobs long. Um, and people always work out very quickly how redundant I am. <laughs> We're going to actually talk more about that seriously. And that is not, that is absolutely not the case. But before we do, you have to go back in history just a little bit to set the stage for where marketing has been, and in order to then talk about where it is today, but just, yeah, I don't know, go back 20, 30 years, you know, what was the state of marketing in companies like consumer products companies, and, uh, and what was the role of marketing? It's a very good question. I mean, if we went back to the 50s and Peter Drucker and his famous book about uh, business, he said a business has one objective, which is to create a customer, and therefore it has two uh, functions. One was marketing and the other was innovation because they produce results. So marketing was right at the heart of what a business did. The marketer was the, the hub of the wheel, if you like. And it had line management responsibility all the way from the P&L. And if you remember the four Ps, the product, the price, the place and the promotion, all of that came through the marketing and it was very disciplined. Yeah, that's uh, the old McCarthy four Ps. And, uh, and it worked at, for many decades because... People were selling products or services that were branded and mass marketed, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. And, uh, you know, the discipline that went into that, the, the thought, the creativity, the measurement, but also the science and the understanding of where the cu customer was and where the customer was going, that was empirical to the success of a business. And the, the, the whole field of marketing research was very quantitative and lots of benchmarks, very precise. And you know, there was a book, a handbook, this is the way to do it, and it worked. Yeah, we got better and better at making it work. And, um, and then of course, things changed as they always should. Marketing, I remember all the way through my career, it's always been every year was the most exciting year to be in marketing because something was changing. And the most expensive. And the most expensive, <laughs> that's true. Well, you know, you said something that was interesting. You, you said, Marketing used to be line management. Just share what you mean by that. So if you were a marketer, um, you tended to be trusted with understanding from right at the inception of what a consumer or a customer might need, all the way to the creation and the dissemination of the product and the communication. You were in control of all of that. And um, lots of functions worked into you. As Drucker said, you know, marketing was one of the fundamental enterprises um, of a company. I think it has changed, however, and, and perhaps as we look to what's changed, the role of marketing has started to fragment, started to fray, and started to be a little bit more diverse. Having said that, I personally believe it's no less important than it ever was. And, you know, and, and part of the concept of line management is having P&L accountability from driving revenue you know, to controlling costs and so forth, and therefore working you know, broadly with the supply chain, if you were in a manufacturing environment, et cetera, but all of the staff areas, you know, in, in collaboration and through influence in order to, to grow your business. And so that was, that was kind of where it was. Not so much line today. No, but using your language, Steve, more staff, you know, more like a, a consultant on the edge of the business rather than a function in the center and the heart of the business. Yeah. Is that a good thing? Um, I think for some companies, actually, it may well be because for some companies, as technology has changed, perhaps the, the story you tell and the who you tell it to becomes an input, not necessarily the center of it. 
But for most businesses, certainly scale businesses, I think it's a mistake. Yeah. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, there were dozens and dozens of consumer products companies. And so this profession, this brand management system, for example, which was largely created, I think, by Procter and Gamble back in the in, in the post-World War II era, that kind of all merged together. And, you know, so there are very, there's much fewer of these consumer products companies, but more service companies, technology companies. And so our consumption as consumers have changed. And, you know, what used to be the consumer products world has shrunk. Yeah, although the consumer remains the same. So that's interesting to say that uh, they're out there, human beings are the same. You know, that's one C that didn't change, customers and consumers. A lot of the Cs, words beginning with C in the world of marketing and communication have changed. Yeah, and we're going to talk about technology and digital as it relates to the role of marketing. But as an industry, technology and digital engages a lot of consumer direction and therefore a lot of marketing, but it's a different kind of marketing. It's a very different kind of marketing. I mean, just a few little facts and figures, 95% of uh, teenagers in this country now have a phone. Uh, The average consumer opens their iPhone 80 times a day and interacts with it over 2,000 times. Now, inside of all of that, of course, every one of those is an opportunity for a message to be served, but also some data to be captured. So um, the how we market, you know, gone are the days, I think, sadly, of a beautifully constructed piece of film with some music and a story in it. And now we're much more about the, the quick hit, short burst of just like trying to catch your attention rather than engage your heart and your mind. Yeah, it's a it's it's a different world. And, you know, the other thing is healthcare, of course, which is nearly 20 percent of the economy. And, you know, people think of that, you know, more as well, when I get sick or, you know, it's, it's but it is it is a consumer business. And so that's that's a fifth of what marketers focus on today. And that's changed the world. Yeah. And, you know, the marketing of healthcare and the healthcare of marketing, which sounds like an odd thing to talk about, those two things are. Uh, a, a driving change in a way that we should do. And I'm not saying that the old world was better and I'm not saying that the new world is defunct. What I would advocate for is the best mix of both to solve any given business's problem in particular, not in general. And so the, the, the connection here, the thing that has stayed the same, as you said, is the consumer. And regardless of how you organize within a company or the kind of company you are, that end focus on the consumer has never varied in its importance. No, I mean, fundamentally, as Drucker said, you know, business creates a customer and then you hold on to them and you, you fill them with delight and joy at your experience and then you will be able to make more money from them as they go forward. So the customer, the human being, the way we, we operate has, has stayed the same. Our expectations, however, of companies, of brands, of products, of services, our expectations have been elevated. And how, and how have those expectations changed? So a lot of things beginning with the letter C have changed. We have to talk about technology, so let's start with computers. It's not just the fact that the computer exists and we've all got one. It's what it can do and how it captures data and how it spots patterns and how it, it makes new things happen. Three other things that come off the back of that. Conversation happened between a, con- a company and its individual consumer. Uh, communications change, the way that you can reach out, but also listen, but also what your employees, for instance, expect of communication. And um, the ability to do commerce changed. So yes, there's e-commerce, but all of the things that went into creating something that had value that people were willing to pay for, they're dictated in a large part by the interactions that go on on machines in the metaverse, if you like, rather than just solely in, in uh, in the universe. Yeah. So, you know, if you go back to the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, I mean, that was, you know, all of those decades were more similar than different in the sense for marketers, in the sense that it was a mass market uh, marketing job, right? I mean, you had three networks, you had the Seven Sisters magazines, I remember. Uh, So you always had to have, you know, this great film, as you said, and this great print, this art. And that's what you focused on in marketing. But then it went in the 90s and the aughts to 
you know, mass customization. And now it's, it's really a one-to-one -one world enabled by the seas, right? Yeah, enabled by those seas. And um, I think, like I said, it's, it's how you get the best of both. We haven't, we haven't given up the world of Madison Avenue, um, but we also need to think about Menlo Park and you put those two things together and we should get the best of both. So I think the, the, the promise of digital was it was going to cut out wastage, right? The, the, the people that we were targeting weren't always captured by a spot in the middle of, uh, I don't know, happy days or whatever you want. Um, and so as we got more discreet, we'd be able to target more. The downside of that though, for some companies, that's amazing, especially business to business. The downside for mass marketers is whilst targeting the individuals gets easier, aggregating scale has become very difficult. Now that's interesting because, you know, what the promise was of, of digi the digital age, and it started out with computers and desktops and went to laptops and now, we're, you know, we're all mobile, right? But the promise was that we could reach somebody with a custom message that was relevant to them and therefore the, the consumer would engage more deeply with us. That was the theory. That's the theory. And therefore every, every dollar, every cent, every euro, every pound you spent would work harder for you. What I think for mass marketers they worked out is that it wasn't the people who were not in your target audience. I'm selling a pair of Levi jeans. I only want to target you know hot young men who think that that's important that they wear them. It actually, the people that you reached as well, the older gentlemen who perhaps wanted a pair of jeans too, they weren't worthless. They were just worth a little less. And now with digital, you just get that young man with his jeans or the teenage girl for the pop or whatever it wants. Maybe. Maybe. Right? Because as you were saying, you know, you, were, you always had a bullseye, but there was this broader target and, and that made up a lot of volume, a lot of revenue. But maybe, I say maybe because do we really, are we really having that digital one-to-one -one conversation that, that was promised by this technology? Do we really have their attention and engagement? Well, to go back to some of the, the data, I mean, imagine a teenager today interact with their phone over 2,000 times in a day, right? A tap or a spit. Right, so but how, how, much, much so how much attention can they have on any one of those 2,000 interactions? It's a very good point. And we're finding that actually for mass marketers, the return on marketing investment has actually started to decline as a result. Maybe we'll come out the back end and maybe it will get better. But yeah, we, we're having lighter interaction. The average attention span of a human being apparently has fallen to eight and a quarter seconds. Nobody talks about the fact that maybe the brain has speeded up and, and young people today perhaps think faster than older people um, in our generation. But there is a little bit that goes, attention is, is worth something. But also, we also know that when you're not paying attention, your brain still may be absorbing a message. So it's an interesting world. They used to call that subliminal advertising. Subliminal what do they call advertising, it today? low involvement processing. There's also a school of thought that says there's no such thing as that, but that you get, you get somebody's attention, even if it's fleeting, it's still worth something. But I think, um, I think some animals are more equal than others. But Ivan, you know, when, when I'm looking at my weather channel, you know, and, and checking the temperature and this, this ad comes up and it's about this big and I can't see it. Does it make any noise? I mean, if the, if the tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it. In other words, how much impact can it make if you, you know, with, with these small interactions? So I think the promise of digital is not to get you when you're not interested. That was what the promise was. The promise, I, I, I would use a term, I wanted to create a whole new science called trigonometry, which is data should be able to tell me when you're not looking at the weather channel, but when you're looking at your phone and you are thinking, I wanna go on holiday, or you're thinking, I want to know the cheapest place for my gas, or you're thinking, I'm hungry and I want my breakfast. Those triggers where you are much more receptive to advertising, that was the promise of digital. Um, and the data would, would bear it out and the machine would fix itself not happening. Not happening. And see, that's the issue. So it was the big promise that you'd be able to hit somebody with a one-on-one -on -one relevant message, engage in a deeper fashion. But in fact, what we're, what you're, the world that you're describing is it's more fragmented than ever yeah. before. There's less attention. I mean, 2000 interactions, who can remember all 2000 of them and then have it, you know, really uh, impact purchase, uh, not only intent, but purchase behavior. Well, let me, let me build the case for why 
it is still exciting because because if I can get you when you are more receptive, I don't have to have you walk, you know, put on your shopping list, go on Thursday, put it in the car. You can click and buy. So for many businesses, we, we, we tend to always think about mass marketing, business to business. You know, if you are, if you just hit a search term that says, you know, I'm looking for software X that does job Y, I can send you a message and get you and you can buy immediately. So it's not without it. I think what I'm advocating, Steve, is ask yourself the job you want to get done for the people you want to do it to, the change you want to happen, and then pick. Sometimes an old-fashioned radio ad or a billboard will be much more effective, but sometimes doing something on signal or you know, trying to find something in the middle of, uh, of TikTok. Sometimes those things are effective too. Okay, we're gonna, come, we're gonna come back on, on right. that after the break and, and pick up where we left off. We've talked about where marketing has been in the history. We've started to talk about where it is today and next we'll talk about where it's gonna go. I'll be right back with my conversation with Ivan Pollard. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a U.S. recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation rate in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, the Conference Board continues its long-standing tradition of providing timely and relevant content on a daily basis to help guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side by visiting our free economic hub entitled, Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession, located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Ivan Pollard, the head of the Marketing Communications Center. Okay, so Ivan, before the break, we're talking about the history, mass marketing and so forth, and how through mass customization, and now it's it's one-to-one. -one. Now, you just said something interesting. So if you think about digital marketing and these one-to-one -one messages, it's difficult to get attention. It's fleeting. You've got 2,000 interactions a day, but it does have one huge benefit, which you can click and buy. So whether it's B2C or B2B, however you think about it, there is the opportunity to convert awareness directly through intent, directly through action mm -hmm. digitally. That is a huge difference. Massive difference. And again, should make the, the marketing more economic. But then you go back to the old school that goes, but what, what is likely to predispose me to bother to click? I, I probably want to know who you are and what you stand for and where you come from and who else is buying you. So some of the old fashioned techniques about brand building and some of the modern techniques about instant interaction, that should be almost nirvana for a marketer to be able to shortcut what we used to call the customer journey. And instead of having to travel by ship, I can be like Star Trek and just beam down to the planet on the transporter. That's the magic that we're looking to unlock. Some companies are doing it brilliantly. Other companies are, are working towards it. I think this notion of scale and the scaled advertisers, that's where I think the big challenge is for marketing. So you're making a case then that mass marketing still has a role mm. in, the, in the toolbox, but that digital needs to lead to some level of conversion. Yes. And it's those two things working together. And I, I, I'll go back, I keep saying it, you know, what's the job you've got to do and what's the tool that's going to get it done most effectively and efficiently? And um, don't start with, you remember five, 10 years ago, people were talking, what percentage of your budget is going digitally? You know, is it 25, 30? Some of the big CPG companies made declarations they would be 80 to 100% digital by year X. Now we're finding that actually you've got to you got to play the tunes and uh, where you spend your money is a function of what you want to get done. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, we joked uh, at, the, at the top of the, of the webcast about turnover in marketing. And I said, we'd come back to it. You know, 
you'll share with us the statistics, but the marketers are, you know, the CMO is like the, has like the shortest tenure in the organization next to the CEO, I think. What, so there's this gap, CMOs report to the CEO typically. What, so there's gotta be a gap between the CMO and the CEO if there's such turnover. Well, there is. And I think the expectations that the CEO has, the business has actually of a marketer need to get reset because of all this change that we've talked about. I've heard some anecdotal evidence that uh, people have done studies that said the job of a CMO has now got 6x the complexity and the uh, responsibility if you bundled it all together than it did in 1980. The job of a CFO has only gone up 15%. Only. Only. And there's a bit where you go, okay, it's a bit more anecdotal. All, all those CFOs out there, it's only 15%. Only 15%. You should be glad you're not a marketer. Yeah. And um, one of the results of that, of course, is, is the expectation of the job of a CMO is, is getting dispersed across the organization. And remember, if you're not the center of the wheel, the hub, and your staff, it's very easy for some of those things to be saying, okay, we're not going to get you to do the R&D marketer we're going to give that to a different team and the digital stuff needs to come over here and actually you need somebody who is um, integrating all of these functions to serve better serve the customer and the consumer so it, it so it seems like there's a there's, there's a disconnect between ceos and cmos in the in the expectations and what i hear you saying you didn't say it precisely this way but in the old days you had a line role as a marketer and you could you could implement new products, you could implement you know, your formula changes, yada, yada, yada. Now the CMO is dealing mostly with the brand, yes. right? And not, does not have line accountability, does not have revenue accountability, doesn't have the resources in the company, and yet is expected to drive the revenue. Yeah. And so it's being held accountable without having the responsibility. The authority. I think um, it has shifted this is a massive generalization, but from a role of authority to a role of influence, um, and maybe other functions have too, but with, with just only influence, you cannot act with the speed and the agility with which the consumer and the customer demand you to do that. So uh, some of those stats, the average, the median tenure, sorry, according to Spencer Stewart of a CMO in North America now, is 25 and a half months. That was uh, uh, a stat. Good news it's stabilized, it's not still going down. Median tenure of a, a CEO is over five years and a COO, um, sorry, a CCO, a chief communications officer is 40 months. So there is turnover. Some people might think it's because marketers are brilliant and everybody wants them, so they get tempted away. Other people like you might say, how come you can't hold on to a job? So somewhere between those two, the role of a marketer needs to get clarified and, um, and I think business needs to put them back in positions of not on everything, but on some line management yeah, end I, to end. And I, I think, you know, as a, as a, as a CEO, I, I put a lot of responsibility on the, on the CEO on this thing. I mean, 25 months is barely enough time to find the yeah. restroom, you know, so, so therefore there is, there is a mismatch in this. And I think the CEOs need to really rethink the role. And if you're going to hold somebody accountable to accomplish something, give them the tools or allow them the tools to do it. But you talked about influence management, which is a different skill set for marketers than it used to be in the, in the, you know, it wasn't, you didn't need to run through influence when you were the hub of the wheel, you were running everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was better if you influenced rather than directed, but now it's pure influence. And so it's a matter. So it's a skill set difference for expect, you know, the, in, in terms of driving the expectations uh, of the CEO. What does that mean for the profession? Well, I think the profession has an existential moment now where um, we were doing a round table the other day with some of our members. We asked, hey, would any of you encourage your sons and daughters to go into the profession of marketing? And that evolved into a discussion about whether marketing is one thing anymore. And, um, and what is marketing? What is marketing? And this notion that it, it, it is literally, you know, trying to find a way of fulfilling unmet needs and desires and making money from it. I kind of like that. But all the things that go into that now, do you want to be the digital marketer, the internal communication specialist, the R&D person, the insights gatherer, the analytics person, all of those skill sets need to be 
encapsulated in the marketing function, but in the chief marketing officer, how is it that you can know all of that? Roger Roger Manor at MasterCard, the CMO there, just wrote a book called Quantum Marketing. In it, he defines the critical, simple characteristics of a CMO of the future. And uh, I was interviewing him and I said, Roger, you've got over 20 critical disciplines that these people need. How on earth could you not cut it down any further? And he laughed at me because he said when he first did the draft, we had 44 and the editor took some of them out. So you should feel good about 20. But, you know, at the end of the day, it comes back to what Drucker said. Yeah. You need to develop a customer and then you need to convert a customer. So why couldn't we just simplify it to that? Because I, I, I think we can, but on the other hand, what goes into developing a yeah. customer? Yeah. What goes into converting? What goes into working out how to do that profitably? Those things, and how do you do it with speed? Because um, one you of the only other have 25 C's, months. You only have 25 <laughs> months, so you better get it. You better win several <laughs> customers in the first two days. And uh, I think one of the other C's that, that changed is competition. Yeah. You know, there used to be when I was growing up, there was a barrier to entry. We were told there's a barrier to entry. Yeah. And you don't say that in front of the attorneys. You never said that in front of the attorneys. But um, but it was what we would talk about. But, you know, we, we had we had time to react. Now there's no barrier. In yeah. fact, almost there's a downhill slope. If you're new in the market, people want you. So the world has changed also in terms of, you know, who are the stakeholders of a corporation? Mm -hmm. So we're in a multi-stakeholder world, customers, employees, owners, community, environment. What impact has a multi-stakeholder world had on the profession of marketing? Well, again, it's one of those factors that's gone into the, uh, the expansion of the role um, and possibly the fragmentation of it. All stakeholders were always important. Um, they just didn't have the same transparency into the organization and ability to change the direction of the company. So. Back in the 80s, we would talk about managing constituents. Employees, of course, were important, but they were nowhere near as important as the customer or the consumer. Um, now I think it's changed, and I think um, you have to take account of all of them. It's just the playing field has leveled up, but still, customer, consumer, that should be, and our data would show it, it needs to be the thing that you focus on most, but you can't ignore the others. Yeah, and marketers are not strictly, CMOs are not strictly focused, and CCOs, chief yeah. communications officers are not focused strictly so, on the customer. They are focused on, on all the stakeholders. Also, you know, we are, we have moved to a not more of a knowledge-based economy and that's impacted the field. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I would argue marketing was always knowledge-based. It was about who, who could look at the same things as everybody else did, who could see something slightly different, and then who could do something with that that was going to make the company money? So it was ideas. It was all about ideas. And an idea that never happened was just a marketer's imagination. So it was about execution. Um, but yeah, the knowledge-based economy and the knowledge that comes with data, I think that is the next epoch of marketing history. So are we going to be able to replace marketing with AI? You know, we're just computers are going to run marketing in the future. Back in 1992, honestly, Steve, I wrote a paper for the IPA in England about that, predicting a future where all of marketing, the creation of a product, the creation of communication, the buying and sending of it, I wrote a paper saying that is the future. I was completely wrong because I missed two things. Number one, I hadn't heard of the internet, really, or the mobile phone. And number two, the other thing, the delivery system might get better, but ultimately, that's a level playing field. It's going to be the storytelling, the oldest skill of human beings. Human beings are storytelling animals. The postal service got better. We still need to work on how you write a beautiful letter. And ultimately, it's all about connecting with individuals and we're social beings. And this is yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. So, Ivan, if you had one message for CEOs, CMOs, and CEOs, what would it be? Marketing works. Wow. Ivan, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Now, could you tell me where the restroom is? Yeah, that's it. That's a, well, it's, it's month 26, so forget about it. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for checking in to CEO Perspectives today. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader dealing with the insights of the issues of our time. We'll talk about 
insights in geopolitics, economics, human capital, marketing communications, ESG, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues. Everybody listening is a marketer, so market this. You know that they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this webcast and podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board.